Well, I just want you to know that we as a church believe that it's crucial. It's important every single time that we meet to open the Word of God and to look at some of the riches and the treasures that we can find there. And uh, we believe that this is God's authoritative love letter to his people. It is truth. Uh, we believe that truth, according to what we learned in uh, Awana, truth is what is, help me, real. real. And truth, to know and to follow the truth is really important. And who is the source of truth? Jesus. And who is the source of lies? Satan. And are we living in a, an age of truth <laughs> in our culture? Probably not. So we get to be those who pay attention to God's truth, and we get to be those who read the Word of God. And frankly, the older I get, the more I just want to read God's Word, what the Bible says. And uh, we may not all agree on how it all fits together, the scope of uh, Redemption, the how Genesis fits with Revelation, uh, but that's okay. I, I just want to read and know and study the Word of God. So today, we're going to be looking at John chapter 12, and I don't know about kids going to children's church, but we got a few minutes. Or do you want to go now? Oh, whenever. You can interrupt this, okay? It's no big deal. When it's time to go. So John 12, um, verse 20. We're in the middle of this section right before the most amazing week in the life of Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all spent most of their writing, most of their ink was written about this last week in the life of Jesus on the earth. And we learned last week about his triumphal entry, how he came from uh, Bethany and then uh, uh, I'm sorry, Beth's, Bethage, the next little village, and then rode into Jerusalem for his last time on the back of a donkey. And uh, he, he rode into Jerusalem to the, to the shouts and the greetings and the, um, you know, uh, welcoming of some of the people who were gathered there for the feast of Passover. Um, and he was the king. Jesus is the king. That means that he is the creator, that he has the inherent right and authority to rule in this world. And But his kingdom is made up of him as the king and the subjects of Jesus are those who follow him. So, uh, you know, when we say your kingdom, you know, the kingdom is at hand, I would say he's here and his kingdom is uh, those who are his subjects who are following him. And uh, so Jesus came riding into Jerusalem to the shouts of some of his disciples, some people who had witnessed his miracles, some who had come from great distances, even from Galilee up north, to be there, to be in Jerusalem. And uh, so here he was in Jerusalem, uh, for the last time. And uh, today, though, we're going to be looking at from verse 20 down to verse 26. And I'm telling you, as wonderful as it is to think about heaven and glory and the second coming of Christ and what it's going to be like when we are dead, <laughs> I mean, that's going to be okay. Believe me, that is our glory. Death is the glory of the believer, not to be feared, but uh, it's going to be a wonderful uh, moment for the believer. But today, we're not talking about that time. I'm talking about now, in the life of the church of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, there are churches closing down in our country. COVID has taken its uh, toll um, and 
the opposition of Satan has certainly been um, effective in some ways, and um, and uh, I was just in a church in the what's that city down the freeway about an hour, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, it's in the middle of one of the hottest areas in that city where there have been a number of protests and uh, the, they keep uh, raising their head there and it's very difficult and it's in a big city and this, this uh, I would say, doctrinally strong, uh, good church is facing the possibility of closing their doors. And uh, here we are up in Winlock, a little ways north. And I wonder what our future is as a church. I really do. I think it depends a lot on what we deal with today. Because I think Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He was talking about the future. He was talking about very real things. And so here in John chapter 12, verse 20, I I know kids are going to get up and go. So do you want to go now? Do they want to go or do you want to? I mean, I'm not trying to get rid of anybody here, so. I don't like to get rid of anybody out of here. We, don't, we need more in here. So, uh, okay, so John chapter 20, I'm mean John chapter 12, verse 20 says, Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, if it dies, it bears much fruit. If it dies. It bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me and where I am There my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Jesus said that his hour had come. And we have read over and over and over in the book of John. Jesus said in John 2, 4, in John 2, 7, 6, 7, 8, 7, 30, 4, 1, 4, 23, 8, 20. And then he will say in 13, 1 and 17, 1, he will say, my hour has not come yet. My hour has not come. My hour has not come. It's not here yet. Okay? He says it over here, my, my, over and over. My hour has not yet come. Um, My time is not yet here. My time is not yet fully come. Over and over. But now, Jesus says, my hour is here. And so this is is an important thing. I want you to just flip over to 13. John 13, verse 1. We'll get there again in the future, but 13.1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, and having loved his own, he loved them to the end. So Jesus, knowing that his hour had 
come. So we're looking at the time in Jesus' life when his hour had come. Okay, with me? Are you with me? Are you awake? Are you? Do you need to go get some coffee? No. You can if you want some, but... Anyway, um, so uh, the leaders, the leadership of Israel, have weighed in on Jesus. And they have decided, as leaders, as officials, to vote no. They have rejected him. And uh, then they were trying to figure out what to do with Lazarus with Exhibit A. <laughs> uh, here's Lazarus, this guy that Jesus, the one they hate... The one they had decided officially to put to death, the one that they were looking for so that they could seize him, and here's Lazarus, and he's the one, everywhere Lazarus went, people were reminded of Jesus. And so he was exhibit A, and so uh, they had decided they have to put him to death because many of the Jews were going away it says in chapter 12, verse 10, here's why the Pharisees were so, so struggling with this. Chapter 12 and verse 10, it says, but the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. And this was a threat to their place as a nation, their position as leaders in the country. And he was a threat. And so uh, the Pharisees had given orders according to 1157 that if anyone finds him, that they would let him know where Jesus is so that they might seize him. And the, the Pharisees said to one another in 1219, um, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. So he was a threat to the status quo. He was a threat to the leadership of the nation. And so today, we want to just look at this two basic ideas. I'm going to look at the setting first a little bit, and then I'm going to look at... Um, this is small print. The finish line of Jesus' ministry. The climax or the finish line of Jesus' ministry. And then I want us to look at the finish line of our ministry for him. Okay? That's all today. So the setting will begin there um, in your yellow sheet there. Uh, first of all, it was Passover. So there was a lot of people, two and a half million people perhaps, that had come uh, to um, the area of Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And that was a normal thing. Jesus had been to three or four of those in his lifetime, uh, in his, yeah, and uh, that we know about. And so they came to the temple. And uh, the temple was the center of the life of Israel. It was the place uh, where all of Israel would gather. And then there's the mention of the Greeks being there. The Greeks were the ones who probably spoke Greek. So they got up in the morning and spoke Greek at the breakfast table. Um, they were from... Uh, Let's see, what did I put down here? They may have come from any part of the Greek-speaking world, possibly from a Greek city in Palestine. We don't know exactly, but they were Greeks. They were not Jews. They were Greeks who spoke Greek. And uh, uh, so, and in the New Testament, the word Greeks are just a reference to Greek-speaking Gentiles. And uh, there's one in the New Testament that's very intriguing to me. I want you to turn with me real quickly to Acts chapter 10. Um, I love this guy. He is kind of like one of those things that people can't quite put in a category. They can't quite figure him out because he's a Greek. He's a Gentile. And yet, he has a deep heart for God. He has a, a deep uh, interest in God. And so it's in Acts chapter 10, uh, verse 1. 
I won't spend long here, but let's read what the Word of God says. So now there was a man in Caesarea, which is on the coast, northern coast of Israel, and he was named Cornelius, a centurion um, of what was called the Italian cohort. <laughs> and, and all I'm going to say is, look what it says about him. He was a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. And about the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? Courier, sir, and he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, Peter, whose house is by the sea. And so you guys know the rest of the story. And eventually this centurion, who is not saved, not regenerate, not a believer, but at the same time, here he is, he's devout, he fears God, he gives alms, and in this story comes to a place where he is able to hear the word of God, to hear the gospel and respond. And uh, one famous preacher who has a particular um, doctrinal position on this doesn't know how to explain God at work in this man. Um, it, it's just, I don't understand it. I don't know how to evaluate this. I'm just going to say, here's a man, a Greek, a Gentile, who was interested in God. So back in John chapter 12, you have these Greeks who are at the temple. And they would come to the temple, and, and they were not Jews. They were not officially fully Jewish people. They came to the temple to worship God there. And um, they belonged to the class of Gentile who attached themselves to the Jewish way of life and synagogue worship without becoming full proselytes or converts to Judaism. They're like the Ethiopian eunuch, okay? The Ethiopian was a Gentile. He was from what country? <laughs> Boy, that's a trick question. If you can't get that one, you guys are sleeping. So what continent? <laughs> Africa. Okay, there you go. So he was a Gentile, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. But I tell you what about him. And any Greek, any Gentile who came into the temple to worship Yahweh, guess where they got to worship? In the court of the... No. Well, maybe that's... I'm just going to say the court of the Gentiles. So there was an inner place where the Jewish people circumcised, the covenant people could come and worship and outside of that center place was the court of the Gentiles, and there were even signs there. And on the signs, they were basically saying, if you're a Gentile and you come in here to the inner Jewish area, you will be put to death. They called it the wall of partition. Anybody know what that refers to, by the way, in other Rusty? <clears throat> the dividing wall of partition. Anyway, uh, that, that's what the wall was. It was a place where um, Greeks or Gentiles who came to worship in Jerusalem and to connect themselves with the God of Israel, they had a place where they could worship, but they couldn't go in further. <clears throat> and so um, it's interesting. I wrote this down. I found this out that... Um, there was a, let me see if I can find the, my notes here. Um, there was, 
Vesalius. Uh, he was a famous leader, and he came, this is about seven years later, he came to Jerusalem with Herod the Great, and if I remember the details right, and when he went into the temple, because he was a Gentile, he couldn't even go in to the Jewish section. And here he was, uh, a big wig, uh, a political leader of his day. And so there was always this strict division between Jew and Gentile. And, uh, <clears throat> so, and, and so if you go back to John chapter 12, um, verse 20, it says, there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip. Philip is actually a Greek name. We don't know everything about Philip, but they came to Philip. He was one of the early disciples of Jesus. And they came to Philip, partly because perhaps Philip was from Bethsaida in the north in Galilee. And many of these Greeks had come from Galilee. Maybe they knew each other up north. I don't know. But they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. I was listening to a podcast or a teaching by Dr. John Hanna at uh, Dallas Seminary uh, this week, actually. And at the end of a course that he was doing on the history of doctrine or some church history, he said, I just, uh, I, I've been working on my will. I, you know, and I want to make sure that I've got things in order at the end of my life because, um, you know, uh, so he said, my will, and I've changed it several times, but my will has two parts. And the second part is all about the stuff that I have that I'm going to give to somebody someday. So that's this part two. But part one is, this is the will, this is what I want to give to my children and my important people in my life. And he says, I want them to know the treasure that I have in Christ. I want them to know the Jesus that I love. I want my kids, I want my grandkids to know Jesus. And it's interesting, these Greeks, these non-Jews, were saying, we wish to see Jesus. So Philip came and told Andrew, because Andrew seemed to be a pretty resourceful guy, remember? He's the guy that came with his lunch at the feeding of the 5,000 and said, you know, and he was, so Philip came um, and got Andrew, and Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And the next few verses in my Bible, uh, verse 23, 4, 5, and 6, are read in red letters. Uh, it's all the Word of God, of course, but these are, these are words, significant words that Jesus taught. And the first part of this has to do with Jesus. So this is where you go in your notes to the first part that says the finish line of Jesus' ministry. So Jesus is going to talk about his finish line, his, uh, the climax of his life, his hour that had come. And so... Um, he says, let's just read what Jesus said. The hour has come, verse 23, for the Son of Man. That's how Jesus liked to talk about himself. That was the name he gave himself. I took my grandkids fishing this week, and Logan keeps calling me Grandpa Dwight. <laughs> and I don't know how many times I say, I'm Papa Terry. <laughs> and he said, okay, Papa Terry. And then we'd be fishing a little later, and he'd say, Grandpa Dwight. <laughs> So he's spent a lot of time with Grandpa Dwight, I think. So. But anyway, Jesus' self-designation over and over again is the Son of Man. He's the Son of Man. That's how he designated himself. But he said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So this is the hour. This is the time when the Son of Man would be glorified. And he uses the imagery here of a kernel of wheat, a grain of wheat, a, a, a one little seed that um, 
and he uses that to teach a really important principle. And it's what we're talking about this morning. Jesus knew that unless, and he said, my body is like a grain of wheat. It's like a little seed. And he says, unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and what? Dies. It remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces much a, a harvest, right? So that's what Jesus was teaching. He started to say, truly, truly, this is important. This is a principle. This is about my life. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, if it dies, it bears much fruit. And there were those who loved Jesus, who didn't want to see him die. They had other expectations for him. They loved him. <clears throat> they were close to him. And Jesus was teaching at the beginning of his Passion Week that this kernel of wheat, his body, needed to die in order to produce a harvest. <clears throat> And so that's what he was teaching. I want you to just hold your finger there and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15. And um, let's see. Oh, it's in your bulletin too. 36, 15, 36. So it says, <clears throat> you fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not, and that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just like, just as he wished, and to each of the seeds, a body of its own. So he's talking about the resurrection body, the, the way it's going to be in the future. A body, this, you know, in, in fact, uh, the graveyard is often called, the cemetery is called the place where the body sleeps, awaiting the resurrection of the body. So Jesus was teaching this conditional idea that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it bears, uh, sorry, uh, it bears much fruit. But if it doesn't fall into the earth and die, it remains alone. So what he's saying is death is necessary for a harvest. Death is necessary for a harvest. And we know that about Jesus, right? We know that he died. We know that he gave his life. We know that he became poor. We know that he poured out the blood on the cross as a substitute for our sins so that we might have spiritual life, right? He died so that we might have life. And we, we know those truths pretty well. So now we're going to come to us because the same principle that um, applies to Jesus applies to me and to you. And that is that death is necessary for a harvest. Death is necessary for a harvest in our lives. Well, what do you mean? Do I have to go out and be a martyr? Well, there is truth that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, that people die. Uh, uh, 
Bruce Wilkinson told the story of uh, going to uh, South Africa. I hope I haven't told you this already, but if I did, just let it refresh. Okay. <laughs> well, he went to South Africa to uh, preach and, and teach. He's a teacher. He, he just has a lot of crowds that come and listen to his teaching. And, and uh, so he was in South Africa and he, uh, yeah, and while he was there, um, one morning uh, a newspaper was slipped under the door of his uh, hotel, you'll remember this, and in big print across the top of the newspaper was that there were 10 million people dying of starvation in Africa, in the continent of Africa, 10 million. And I'm telling you, it hit him so hard, and it hit, hit his family. And uh, they weren't sure what to do with all of that. And, but they really sensed that God was, gonna, that somehow God was speaking to them about that need and perhaps what they could do. And so, um, <clears throat> and at the time, Bruce Wilkinson was living in the States. He was was very happy here, had a wonderful ministry here. And he, um, so, uh, but one night his son David was walking with him and they were walking in some sort of an enclosed mall. And they just started walking together and they started walking together and making laps and and this went on for a long time and they talked and they walked and they were processing thoughts and and they walked and it was uh, 11 o'clock at night and 12 and 1 o'clock in the morning and 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning and about 3.45 he said, I remember standing on a balcony kind of looking out at this mall and um, both Bruce and his son David in the light of the huge need that was there were feeling like God wanted them to perhaps to move to Africa to be able to, to work on that need, huge need. And so, um, somehow or other that ended and I think his family flew back to the States but Bruce stayed there because he was going to Nigeria and uh, he was going to be speaking to 8,000 pastors in Nigeria. And the situation in Nigeria was uh, tough because the uh, radical Muslims were pushing down into Nigeria and the pastors of the churches in Nigeria were uh, either fleeing or, you know, trying to figure out what to do. And what the leader who had invited Bruce Wilkinson to come had said is, um, if Nigeria falls, all of Africa will fall. And so in this conference, uh, Bruce was speaking to 8,000 pastors. And he said to them, um, at the end of his session, knowing the, the climate in the country, he said, um, if you are willing as a pastor to, to go back to your land, to your communities, to your churches, and to be faithful to the gospel, to be faithful to the word of God, no matter what the cost, which in many cases would mean death. To be faithful to Christ would mean to become a martyr. And so at the end of his talk, he invited uh, pastors to, who would like to make that commitment before God and say, I am willing to move back north, to continue to move in and preach and teach and pastor and shepherd and be God's man in my community, 
no matter what the cost. If you would like to do that, would you stand? And there was nobody standing at first. It was a big commitment. And so it was really quiet. And then one guy stood up, one pastor. And then another pastor stood up. And then you could hear, they could hear people crying because they knew what it meant. And so then there were 10, and then there were 25, and then there were 100, and then there were 200, and then there were 300, and then there were 400, and then there were somewhere around 450. And all these pastors came forward, and what they were saying is, here's my life, here is my very life and I am and they understood that harvest and he had taught on this that harvest comes many times in church history through death through martyrdom the, the blood of the saints is the seed of the church that's kind of a well-known statement and so after all these pastors came and stood there the leader of the conference told them, okay, you guys go over here, and we've got some guys here who are going to train you and equip you and prepare you to go back and lead your churches, preach the word of God, to be faithful to God in that setting. And then he asked Bruce Wilkinson to come with him, to come, uh, just to come with him. He wanted to talk to him. Now, oh, 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 yeah, I almost forgot the most important part. I said this last Sunday, I think that was it, that before they left South Africa, Bruce Wilkinson had taken his journal, he loves to journal, and he said, I've never done this in my life, I don't necessarily recommend it for everybody, but he said, I gave God a, a fleece. In fact, I gave him a whole list of fleeces. I don't know if you know the story of Gideon, but the fleece is, God, if you're in this, you're going to have to do this. And if you do this, then I'll do this. That's kind of what was going on. He made a, such a specific list. He said, he said, I just wanted to make it impossible for God to do these things. So he wrote down, okay, God, if you want us as a family and a ministry to move to Africa, number one, you're going to have to have someone walk up to me put their hand on my shoulder and say these exact words. Bruce, God's anointing is on you and you need to move to Africa. <laughs> that was the first thing. The second thing was the king of uh, Nigeria must invite me to lunch <laughs> at his palace. And there were three or four, I don't know how many other ones. So after this meeting, when 400 and some pastors came forward to, to commit themselves to the service of the, the king, Jesus, um, the leader of the conference took him aside toward his house. And on the way over, he said we were standing on a gravel road and that man stopped and said, Bruce, and he put his hands on his shoulder and he said, Ad, word for word, God's, un this is a miracle what happened today. This is not just a great thing. This is not just an amazing thing. This was a movement of God. And he said, Bruce, God's anointing is on you. And we believe you need to move to Africa. That was one thing. And then, I don't know the st whole story, but he got invited to the king's place for lunch. And, and now they live in Africa because they believe God told them to go there. And that's all part of this thing of being willing to die and to give up in order to gain something more. And I believe that the church in our country... And I, not you guys, but the church and, and me, my life. I have been so grappling with this. 
My wife and I have sat down and grappled with this whole idea of when Jesus says, would you be willing to give up, would you be willing to hate not hate in the sense that we normally take hate, but would you be willing to love me, Jesus, more than your spouse, and more than your kids, and more than your grandkids? That's what Jesus said, unless we forsake those relationships. And I don't think he's calling us to love them any less, but he's saying, Unless you forsake them and love me with all your heart, you cannot be my disciple. And I'm not saying today, at the end of the service, we're just going to have this transformation of the body of Christ here. Some of these decisions take us a long time. But the choices are, I believe, that we can be infants... We can be spiritual pygmies, spiritual babies, and never make those tough decisions of the heart where we will become fruitful for God. And so um, I have in your notes here uh, Matthew 10 and Mark 8 and Luke 14. These are the passages in the Synoptic Gospels that talk about this. Okay? Um, but here's what you and I have to grapple with. And I'm planning on teaching through this, leading us through a study on this in September. Um, but it's going to be this idea of surrender to Christ and what it means uh, by the mercies of God, I urge you therefore, brethren, to present your bodies a living sacrifice and what that means and what it means for the church. Uh, God is not calling us to comfort. God is not, if we're really going to experience his blessing and his uh, the fruitfulness for him, it will take us grappling with these issues. So in your notes, you can write these down. The first one is people. We're going to have to love Jesus more than every other person. Um, when Kathy and I left seminary and we came back to Winlock, a big reason, I mean, other than the fact that we were here before and we knew people here and we loved people here and we were invited back, but one of the reasons we came back here was because my parents live in Seattle. Now, I think we did the right thing. I think we did what God wanted us to do. But I, I think with what I understand now, if I was able to say, Jesus, if you want me to be a pastor in Southern California, or God forbid, Texas, or just kidding, Rusty, just kidding, or uh, Georgia, or, you know, or uh, in Canada, or someplace else, would I be willing to go and leave even to separate from people I love uh, for the sake of Christ? That's a huge discipleship issue. And, uh, and I guarantee you when Bruce and his family moved to Africa, it involved people and being willing to love God more than people in his life here. So just an idea. The second thing you can write down there is possessions. This is where, I was just joking earlier when I read this, but it really has to do with we accumulate a lot of possessions in our life. And then at the end of our life, we're trying to figure out how do I get rid of it? How do I get a good deal? Because I paid a lot for this, and now I can only get a 10% at a garage sale. And you know, But really, it has to do with the stuff that we accumulate in life. And so when we say, I will forsake my possessions. It really means I will leave my hands. I will open my hands. I am a steward. I don't own it. I don't own anything. I don't own, God forbid, my 401k, my retirement, my pension. I don't own it. And if God, who loves me and loves the kingdom, says, 
You need to get rid of it. You need to let go of it and give it. I will give it. Now, it's one thing to say, I'll give a little bit. But to really say, I'm releasing my ownership of all of it. I'm going to trust you. And if you tell me to give it away, it's okay. That's a huge thing. And there are people who end up dying with all kinds of resources, all kinds of money, all kinds of money that they've accumulated their whole life. And I tell you, they're going to go into heaven poor, spiritually poor. I'm not trying to get money out of anyone here. I'm saying that we, we need to grapple with the idea when Jesus said, if we don't forsake our stuff, um, we'll never... Um, anyway. The third, play, the third one is place. And whenever I preach on this, I'm always afraid people are going to just head for the exits and go to the airport and we're gone and we won't see you again. But if God tells you, if God says, this is where I am, and Lord, you're the Lord, and if you want me to move, if you want to move me, if you want to move me to Africa, it's okay. I I'm just going to, I am where I am, and as a disciple of Jesus, if you move me, I'm going to go. I'm willing to go. If you say, the anointing of God is on you and God wants you to move to Wenatchee. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. That's a, that's a discipleship issue. That's, a, that's following Jesus with your whole heart. The next one is position. I have a position. I have a, a position in my business. I have a position in my company. I have a position uh, in the church. I have a position somewhere. And being willing to release that and let God be God. And then perhaps the one, the last one that we struggle with the most is our priorities. And this is where we have to decide. You have to decide. God's people have to come if they want to be fruitful, if they want to be used by God, if they want to see a harvest, it requires a decision of a disciple who says, I will rearrange my priorities. My priority is not going to be fishing. And again, sometimes this kind of stuff takes years. It's not going to be hunting, Jerry. Say what? <laughs> Well, I mean, I could have you tell your hunting story and how long it took God to, you know, help you with that priority, you know. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to speak out of turn here. But we, we do grapple with stuff. And, and I think as you get older, you start realizing the time is less. And if I'm going to have a harvest in heaven, maybe I need to change my priorities. Maybe I need to say, this eternal spiritual thing is more important than this foolish activity. And one of the examples I have, and I'm not tooting my own horn at all here, don't take it. If I lose my reward by saying it, so be it. But, you know, I used to come home back in the day, and I could care less today, to be really honest, but I used to watch the Mariners play baseball. And I would come home and just kind of unwind. And I always felt like at least with them, I could turn on a, a game and watch it. And I was always kind of, I could do other stuff, but I would watch the game and kind of get involved in it and want to see who won and want to see how the game turned out. And so, but I'd sit there and sometimes during the baseball season, there's a game every night of the week. Every night. And uh, I think... One day, we got a notice in the mail that said that Comcast was no longer going to be providing cable service in Winlock. And so, you know, I, I don't know, we were paying 35 bucks a month or something. But I think Kathy and I looked at each other and we just thought, huh. So that would mean I had to get satellite 
you know, and I had to pay for that, and, you know, and I just thought, you know, I waste sometimes three hours a night. Rusty, where are you going? I'm heading up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have too. <laughs> just kidding. So anyway, um, yeah, so I thought three hours a night, that's a lot. And, uh, and I thought, you know, TV isn't that great anyway. <laughs> that's a no-brainer in our day. That's a, something that the enemy has captured for the sake of the world and the world system that we live in. The enemy has taken over the media and they are whitewashing, not whitewashing, brainwashing and indoctrinating our nation in things that are ungodly and unrighteous. So that part of it for me was, I don't think I want to watch TV anymore. But then, I decided then to, to uh, become, I had heard about it, and I decided to become a, an online missionary with Campus Crusade. And so I, I've done that. I, I somehow, God has led me to have a heart for Muslims, and I've tried to educate myself about Islam and what they believe and who they are. And, and just this last couple of weeks, I found this wonderful tool that has helped me more than anything so that I can communicate with Muslims and have dialogue with them and communicate the gospel and understand what they believe and how to have a conversation with them. So, you know, and I, I think I've probably contacted around 2,000 different Muslims since we quit watching the Mariners. <laughs> that was quite a trade-off, right? No more Mariners losing and, you know, 2,000 Muslims. And I, I'm not bragging. I, I have so far to, I don't know what that will all be when heaven gets, when I get to heaven. I, I'm not even saying that, but I think that was a shift in my priorities and the use of time many evenings during the baseball season. And I don't care about me. You can watch baseball. You can invite me over. John Howlett invites me over all the time to watch football. And I go there, and I don't pay cable. I don't pay, you know, for it. I'll go watch the game. I love sports. I love it. Don't worry. I'm not that kind of a person. It's fun. Uh, but uh, there are times in our life when we need to understand what our priorities are. And I'm thinking about Awana. You know, Thursday nights come in this church. We've been doing it for 31 years or more. 34 years. Sorry, Jerry. And, uh, you know, that ministry, God has had his hand on it. Our, we get kids here and kids here, and their parents are here hanging around during Awana, and we need leaders and we need helpers. But, you know, in order to get that, we have to have people who will adjust their priorities to become a disciple of Jesus and do what our church does. We need people that are out in children's church right now. We need worship team leaders. We need Bible study leaders. I mean, I don't mean we need it, but if, if we want to see the hand of God, the fruitfulness of God, it will always be on people who have grappled with possessions and grappled with people and grappled with priorities and grappled with place and grapple with these things. And Jesus says, if you don't do that, if I don't do that, if we don't do that, we will not bear fruit. There has to be death of some kind before there can be any harvest. And I'm not pointing at anybody here today. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But uh, So death is necessary for a harvest. We came back from Texas with some blue bonnet seeds and some wildflower seeds, and they're in a real cute little package with beautiful flowers on the front. And as long as those seeds stay in the packets, they will remain by themselves alone. But if you pour them out, I think you have to add a heat lamp up here in Washington. So <laughs> I don't. <laughs> But they will sprout, they will grow. There will only be a harvest if those seeds get poured out and planted in the ground and die. 
And God calls his church to die. God calls me to die. I mean, really, this is not about heaven someday. This is about the kingdom of God now. I want you to go ahead and look at your notes here because this world that we live in, this cosmos, there is someone who rules it, someone who has been disarmed, someone who will face ultimate uh, destruction. He has been sentenced, but he was, has not yet been executed. His name is Satan. And in your notes, you can write this down and look at these verses later. But we know about him a few important things. Um, wow. If I can find my notes. Yeah. So his kingdom, is he's called the ruler or the God of this age, according to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He's the God of this age. Uh, according to uh, Ephesians 2.2, 2, he is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. According to 1 John 5.19, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. The whole world system. There is a system. There is a kingdom. He is a usurper. He is not the rightful king. He is not the creator. He is a created being, but yet he is powerful. And so this is what's at stake. We are in a war against him, against the one who in the garden decided that he wanted to take God's place and be like God and get the glory like God alone should have the glory. And so his kingdom can be described in these words. Go ahead and write them in your notes if you're a note taker. The first one, his kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. His kingdom is a kingdom of darkness and not of light. Uh, Colossians 1.13. Secondly, his kingdom is, is uh, characterized by sin, by that which offends God. That which is offensive to our holy God. His kingdom is uh, described or uh, has to do with sin. The third word is the word deceit. He is the deceiver. He is the one who is the source of lies. He is the one who uh, speaks and speaks that which is not true. And number four ungodliness uh, Psalm 1 3 through 6 Romans 5 6 his kingdom is um, characterized by ungodliness and then the next one is his kingdom is characterized by unholiness uh, 1 Timothy 1 9 and his kingdom is characterized by disobedience to God and his kingdom is characterized by death and not life. So we are in a war. We are in warfare. And the church has always been in that stage and in that state. But we are uh, waging war against the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of this world, the God of this age, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the whole world lies under the control of the evil one. And so what's at stake is God's people have to um, grapple with people, with possessions, with place, with position, and with priorities. We have to. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for moving out of heaven out of the glory of heaven to, to move to this place. Uh, you were willing to move into our world, to move into this dark and uh, sinful place in order to redeem men, to redeem women, to bring people, to bring children into the kingdom of God. 
And uh, Lord, thank you for your willingness to do that. Thank you that you died. Thank you that you gave up your life. That you who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Thank you that you are the substitute. You are the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Thank you for what you did, God. And in response to that, therefore, it's logical, it's reasonable, and I think it's wise for us to grapple with how we're spending our lives. And I know, God, you call us to love you, and you call us to a life of blessing, and you call us to a life of fruitfulness, and you call us through the power of the Holy Spirit in us to make a difference now, while we still have breath, in this life, Lord, you want to change our world. You want to change the people around us. You want the church to grow. You want the church to be powerful in these days. And Lord, I am not going to be pessimistic. I am very optimistic in what you are doing and want to do in your church. So Lord, thank you for this morning. And we pray these things in the name of our Savior Jesus.